Hi, and welcome back to the Contemporary Old West with B.F. Biles. Today I'll take a quick look at the rise and decline of the Comanche Nation. Then I'll have Chapter 13 of Hunting Charm. I've decided to switch up the format a little bit and put the history first. I've thought it over and I've decided asking someone to listen to an entire novel released piecemeal over several months is unreasonable. At some point I plan to put together long segments of the book and release those in something closer to an audiobook format. I'll also eventually release an audiobook version of Hunting Charm on Amazon, as I did with my first novel, Carmelo's Last Ride. I wish I had more hours in the day, uh, but staying committed to the writing is all I can manage at times. Oh, old BF is getting old. Uh, but let's take a look at the rise and decline of the Comanche Nation on today's plate of history beans. For many centuries, based upon what little we know of ancient plains cultures, the Comanche were minor players until they abruptly rose to prominence around the middle of the 17th century. From around 700 AD for a thousand years, while other native tribes developed religions, crafted pottery and woven fabrics, refined farming and construction techniques, uh, created structures for housing, water catchment, food storage, and invented rudimentary currencies and banking, the Comanche remained steadfastly nomadic and failed to develop much beyond the basic hunting party. In a sense, it's understandable their needs, shelter, tools, and food were all provided by the bison. They had no need for a special warrior society, a priest class, or ceremonial worship compared to the dazzling temples and construction of the contemporaneous Aztecs or the refined farming techniques of the Mississippian tribes, for a long time Comanche society was uh, centuries behind. Evidence even suggests that the Comanche weren't much good at war, which is surprising given how, beginning in the mid to late 17th century, they became the most savage and effective warriors known to Native American cultures. The tribe that had once lived in relative seclusion, the lesser child, so to speak, in the hierarchy of Native cultures, grew suddenly into a savage beast. The change happened for one simple reason, when Spanish conquistadors arrived in New Mexico around 1540, they came on horseback. While other tribes would adopt the horse, the Comanche formed a special bond with the animals, and with that relationship, the people, or Nimerna as they called themselves, leapt forward in prominence. Thanks to their unique relationship with the horse, the Comanche were able to claim and hold vast territories uh, that at its peak included southwest Kansas, the western half of Oklahoma, the eastern halves of Colorado and New Mexico, all the way south across the entirety of Texas and into the northern parts of Chihuahua and Coahuila in Mexico. Though it's believed that the Comanche people numbered only a few thousand at their most populous, they maintained massive herds of horses and could travel vast distances to police their territory. At the same time, Comanche savagery in combat was unparalleled. The culture that had never been more than a pack of wandering hunters grew suddenly into a warrior culture that some modern historians have compared to the Mongol armies of the 15th century or the Egyptian Mamluks who faced the armies of the Ottoman Empire. There is some evidence to suggest that the Comanche's fierce pride 
can be attributed to their years of oppression by other tribes. Comanche fighting units, which formed mostly around charismatic individuals, were indiscriminate in, the, in their raids. They did not single out whites for their attacks, but raided neighboring tribes with equal ferocity. As the Comanche rose to power, their brutal attacks obliterated several tribes. The Kansan, Omaha, and Missouri tribes. Uh, thus the belief that the Comanche, who once suffered at the hands of neighboring tribes, may have acted with a sometimes vengeful bent. Even the tribes near the Comanche, who weren't entirely driven from their lands, such as the Ute, Osage, and Apache, survived because they gave way. From the early part of the 18th century until the mid part of the 19th century, it's believed that the Comanche and Apache nations were constantly at war. Details are scarce. One source of evidence of the conflict between the two tribes comes from the Spanish. The Spanish-Mexican government in the 16th and 17th centuries never managed to build well-established settlements in New Mexico or Texas. Indeed, they built a string of high-walled forts along the Rio Grande Valley, reaching all the way to Santa Fe in northern New Mexico. Spanish priests, some of the only accidental historians of events in that part of the world, became aware of the Apache-Comanche War when Apache raids of the Spanish forts became less ferocious beginning in the early 1700s. The Apache could no longer attack the Spanish because they were too busy defending themselves from the Comanche. Sadly, there's almost no written record of the Comanche Empire. It is certainly, however, uh, that Comanche warriors were supremely able when fighting from horseback. One rare description of their talents comes from the artist and journalist George Catlin, who described how even Comanche boys could drop onto the sides of their mounts to shield themselves from enemy weapons and shoot arrows with extreme accuracy beneath their horse's neck. The Comanche's short bow packed enough punch to bring down a buffalo if fired at close range. For decades, white settlers feared nothing quite so much as the Comanche. The other scant history of the reign of the Comanche comes from accounts of Comanche raids on white settlements. Until the advent of the Colt pistol and its adoption by Texas Rangers, the Comanche probably regarded white settlements as easy pickings. There are dozens of accounts of Comanche taking horses and other livestock and killing or kidnapping white travelers or settlers. Old style breech loading guns weren't much good when fired from horseback and cavalry units before the mid 19th century fought mainly on foot. They usually rode their horses to the battlefield and then dismounted to fire their weapons in lines. Comanche warriors who remained on their horses could circle in swarms firing ten arrows in the time it took white soldiers to fire and reload their weapons. More than once, U.S. military forces found themselves pinned down or forced to flee the battlefield when they came face to face with Comanche raiding parties. It wasn't until Colt pistols with revolving five or six shot cylinders came along that Texas Rangers and other US military forces had much success against Comanche raiding parties. What I'm describing may seem like a small window in history, uh, but I will point out that we're talking about a period stretching from the late 17th century into the middle 19th century, over 150 years. 
The glaring cultural differences between the Comanche and other tribes at the time were perhaps most apparent when one compared the Comanche to the five civilized tribes who occupied the eastern half of Oklahoma during some of the same period of time. The differences provide another explanation for why the Comanche were often seen as shockingly savage in their ways. Compared to the Cherokee, Choctaw, Creek, Seminole, and Chickasaw people, who were farmers with towns and organized religions and local governments, the Comanche way of life made little sense to white settlers and, more importantly, to U.S. leaders in Washington. Sadly, to make a broad generalization, it can be said that starting with George Washington and going all the way to Calvin Coolidge, the men in charge of our nation probably viewed one tribal group pretty much the same as another. While there were leaders, most famously Andrew Jackson, who made especially terrible edicts that led to horrific suffering among native peoples, there were, in truth, almost no men in Washington who understood the differences between the myriad of unique tribal cultures at the time in our nation's history. For me, at least, I find that a little sad. We could have been more humane. Few American leaders had even a rudimentary understanding of the differences between a Cherokee and a Comanche. While the Cherokee were building settlements and farms, the Comanche still lived wild and untamed lives, organizing themselves around the command of charismatic leaders. They existed as they always had, mercilessly hunting, stealing horses, and dealing with their rivals in the same brutal ways they had been dealt with for centuries. From the Comanche perspective, their ways were perfectly normal. If you were an opposing tribe, one of the five civilized tribes, say, or a white settler who lived on the edges of their territory, they would think it perfectly natural to raid the farm or settlement, kill all the men, rape, then kill the women, slaughter infants, and perhaps take preteen children captive to raise as their own. If a Comanche lost a battle to an Apache or Sioux or Kiowa, say, they would expect exactly the same treatment. It was their way of doing things. That doesn't mean the Comanche were without honor or a sense of family. When Comanche raided the Parker family fort on the edges of Comanche territory just east of present-day Waco, Texas, in May of 1836, they captured Cynthia Ann Parker and her brother John. Cynthia, nine at the time of her capture, integrated entirely into the Comanche way of life. Later on, when she was forced to return to white society, Cynthia longed to return to the Nemerna. They were her family. So even though people at the time in many cases saw only the cruelty of the Comanche, there was much more there than meets the eye. Comanche were a people who loved and lived as bravely and as honorably as any group of people have ever done now or since. If you see it from that perspective, the Comanche were as amazing as all people are amazing in their own way. Around 1860, almost as quickly as the Comanche had risen to prominence, they fell. Overwhelmed by white settlements and technological innovations in firearms, it must have been a bewildering moment for the Comanche. With only, within only a few years, the sprawling bison herds of the plain were slaughtered by packs of white hunters and the fierce Comanche and their Kiowa allies that had been so effective in battle only a decade earlier were crushed by U.S. cavalry units. 
in eight or nine generations, the Comanche had their 15 minutes of fame and then were almost instantly relegated to a patch of land in southwestern Oklahoma and told to become farmers, something they had no idea how to do. Uh, their history, nevertheless, does continue today and there are stories of greatness that came after the fall of the Comanche Empire. Even so, the great band of horse warriors is gone forever. It's too bad we don't have better records of what their lives were like. If I could climb in a time machine, uh, I think I uh, personally would be interested in finding out. That's it for today's Plate of History Beans. If you're interested in the amazing rise and abrupt fall of the Comanche Empire, I'll have a couple of links below. Thanks for listening. If you like my content, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. As I said already, I've changed up my format here on the Contemporary Old West. I'm going to start with the plate of history beans. Then for those of you less interested in the protracted process of listening to an entire novel spread out over dozens of weeks, I'll simply place that following the plate of beans. So you can, you know, uh, I'd love for you to listen to my book, obviously, but I understand. Soon I'll compile several of the chapters, perhaps even the entire book, into an extended audio book. And for anyone interested in listening to that content in a more contiguous way, that will be there as well. Uh, if you enjoy the weekly uh, segments of the book, keep listening in that way, too. I, I appreciate you, whatever the case. Anyway, here's chapter 13 of Hunting Charm. Thanks again for listening. Hunting Charm, chapter 13, Hillside Skirmish. We're not staying another two days, Brant shouted. Three days is long enough. I, I hunted jackrabbits and poked at tadpoles. We have enough firewood to last a month. Hell, I even read a p part of a damn book. Parker feller ain't coming. If he's not here in two more days, we'll leave. Matt didn't bother to look up from the letter he was writing. You mean if he ain't here in two days, you'll leave because I'm packing up tomorrow morning. You'd leave your best friend out here to face savage Comanches by himself? Damn right. Brent had no plans to leave Matt alone in Comanche territory, but given his nervousness about the situation, he felt more than willing to claim otherwise. What makes you think Quanta is going to come out here just to talk with you anyways? Well, for one thing, Sam and that other fellow said they would bring him this way. Plus, I told Sam I'd give Quanta a pistol for his trouble. What? You can't give a Comanche a pistol just like that. It it ain't lawful, for, for, for one thing, and he's just as likely to shoot you with it as uh, for another. Matt sighed and placed his quill back into its box. Let's wait one more day, okay? Brand started to reply, but from the corner of his eye, he detected movement on a nearby hillside. You see that? What? There, on the side of the hill. Matt saw it as well now. A line of Comanche warriors winding along a narrow game trail. Come on, get in the hole. Brand had constructed a small fortification, a hole dug into a steep embankment. Around the hole he had placed rudimentary battlements of logs and sand, Matt chided his trail partner about the preparations, but at the sight of the approaching riders, he moved without hesitation into the hole. Get that kettle, too, Brant said, and then the two water bags. We might enjoy a little coffee if we're down there a while. Brant's makeshift fort afforded easy access to water and protection for the horses, staked in clear view 20 yards away in a grassy clearing. If worse came to worse, they could scramble down the bank and ride for safety. That's probably Quanah, Matt said. 
Yeah, and maybe it ain't, Brant replied. Even if it is Quanna, didn't you say he took two of those Baylor boys' mule? I'll shoot it out before I give up our mounts. The two men settled in, rifles and pistols ready. When the native riders entered their camp, however, Brant knew that Quanna Parker wasn't in the group. These weren't Comanche warriors, but rather boys, most of them no older than ten or twelve. What do you want? Brant said. The riders stopped, uncertain at first as to the location of the speaker. A moment later, however, they identified Matt and Brant's position and reined their mounts. Brant cocked his rifle and fired a single shot into the sky. Hold up right there, he turned to Matt. Do you think any of them speak English? Doubtful. Matt said. Were you the boys sent here by Quanna Parker? The leader of the group, a boy of perhaps fifteen, replied in halting English. Quanna send us to get you. You come to his camp. Oh, hell no, Brent whispered to Matt. Why would Quanna send boys? Something ain't right. Brant surveyed the surrounding hillside, examining rocks and trees for tell-tale signs of other possible marauders. Well, why would Quanna send a bunch of children, he repeated, this time loud enough for the boys to hear. We are not children. Come out now, or we kill you, white man. That's what I thought, Brant said. These boys are on their own. Two of the riders edged nearer, while others circled down the ravine in the direction of the horses. Back away from our ponies or I'm going to put a bullet in you, Brant warned. The leader of the group looked defiant for a moment, but Brant sensed his uncertainty. A moment later, the teen whistled and gestured for the others to return. If Quana wants to kill you, he will do it himself, the leader said. Quana gives his word. You will not be killed. Shit, Brant hissed. These boys are out running around on their own. Maybe we should... Matt seemed to be considering the invitation. I mean, if they know where Quana is camped, we're not going to ride with a pack of teenage coyotes. You know as well as I do that these Comanche tend to be independent-minded. There ain't no telling what this bunch has planned. Hang on, I, I have an idea. Matt cleared his throat, speaking loudly. Did you boys talk to Sam Running Toes or Nakona? The lead rider paused for a long moment, then replied, Quana say he wants the pistol you promised. The two old warriors gave their wives the things for sewing. So you boys know about the pistol we promised Quana? Did Quana's wife like the sewing kit? You know, he wouldn't be happy if you were to ambush us. Quana send us to bring you to him, the lead rider repeated. You can lead us to Quana's camp. Matt asked. It's just over the hill, the older boy gestured. No, Matt, this is a bad idea, Brant said. Maybe he figures we won't be as nervous with these boys. I, I realize the situation isn't ideal, but if there's a chance Quana sent them, just hang on a minute. Brant stood, rifle still on the lead rider. We don't feel comfortable with the situation. There are eight of you and only two of us. Give us directions to Quana's camp. The lead rider paused for a moment, then said, Quana, say you ride with us or don't come. Brant nodded. It was the response he had expected. We figure Quana wants things fair and square. Why don't two or three of you ride with us and the rest can ride on ahead? 
The lead rider paused for a long moment, then waved most of the group back up the hill, leaving only the three oldest boys. Are you satisfied now, white man? The young warrior sneered at Brant. I reckon so. Brant still felt uncomfortable, but after three days he was ready to move on, though it seemed unlikely uh, Quana had sent the boys it took only a minute to saddle their ponies. They would leave their gear but take the mules. Hopefully the younger Comanche boys wouldn't circle back and steal their things. If worse came to worse, the tents, food, and cooking utensils could be replaced. We're ready, Brant said. They wound their way up the gently sloping trail. Brant scanned ahead and saw that if the boys were planning an ambush, it would come at the ridge line, where the trail disappeared behind a rocky escarpment. Then Matt tapped Brant on the arm. He pointed to something hanging from the arm of the lead rider. It was a small leather bag branded Abilene Mercantile, the bag the boy had told them ten minutes earlier had been given to Quana's wife. This might get to be a warm day, Brant said. I think you're right. Matt nodded at a stand of trees a hundred yards to their right. A bit of shade, he said. Matt and Brant spurred their ponies as a pack of whooping preteens appeared at the top of the trail. Matt and Brant's prescient response to their attack confused the immature warriors, and for a moment the bunch sat in a state of confusion, watching Matt and Brant ride away. They had covered half the distance to the trees before the first bullet whizzed by. Brant, gripping the sides of his quarter horse with his legs, gave his mule a slap on the rump, then turned in his saddle. Holding the reins in one hand and his Winchester repeater in the other, he fired off several rounds. He didn't shoot to kill, but rather to slow the now charging pack. You think this bunch plans on killing us? Matt struggled with his mule and hat. They ain't shooting fake bullets. What is our plan? Matt, now juggling his hat, almost fell off his horse. When we get to the trees, tie off the mules and pony. If I can knock down a couple of their horses, th that would be enough to take the wind out of their sails. <laughs> Matt's speech had suddenly become incomprehensible. Brant turned and saw that Matt now had his hat in his mouth. What? I <laughs> Brant spurred in Matt's direction, reached over and pulled the hat from Matt's mouth and flung it into the air. That was my best hat. Hell, that was my only hat. My, my head will get all burnt up without it. If you're dead, you won't need it. Fair enough. At the tree line, Brant leapt from his horse, took a knee, sighted, exhaled, and gave the trigger a squeeze. Twenty yards away, the mount of the nearest rider buckled, sending its rider flying. Brant fired again, and the second horse crumpled. The attack ended abruptly, the boys scattering for cover. What do you figure they want? Matt asked. Ain't no telling, Brant said. Boys, that age can be unpredictable. I sure as hell was. Are they gone? What do you think? Get the mules and horses ready to go. Brant scanned their surroundings. He assumed the boys would regroup for a second ambush. My mount took a bullet in the hindquarters, Matt said. He's bleeding some, but I don't think it's too bad. Brent recalled the last time they had traveled in Comanche territory. Both of their horses had died, though one of the mounts had carried them to Fort Bascom despite a split hoof and a bullet in its side. The thought of losing a mount made him uneasy. Can he run a bit? Matt asked. Looks like it's just a graze, Matt said. Brant could see the bullet hadn't penetrated. With a little Pratt's ointment, the horse would be fine. Okay, we're going to ride back for that hole by the creek. 
We'll go wide of that oak brush over yonder. Just follow me. They remounted and started down the hillside. For a moment, it seemed like things would be fine. As they reached the bottom of the hill, however, a boy appeared with a sawed-off rifle and fired. Brent felt the sharp sting of a bullet hitting his right leg. He instinctively pulled his pistol and fired. The boy, perhaps twelve, tried to raise his rifle, but only managed a final skyward shot as he fell. Once more they spurred, but none of the other boys appeared. A minute later they were back in camp, the horses and mules secured alongside their fort. You're shot, Matt asked as Brent collapsed against a log. Yes, I, I just hope my legs stopped the bullet. Your horse is shot? I don't know if my dang horse is shot. Yeah, but your horse ain't shot, is it? Did you hear the part where I mentioned I was shot? I heard. I just don't like the idea of having to ride double. Matt pulled his shotgun to his shoulder and fired around. What are you shooting at? Brant glanced around nervously. Warning shot. Well, who are you warning? You're getting difficult to converse with, Hunter. I lost my hat. You're the one who insisted we follow them boys. I wouldn't be so hard to converse with if you wouldn't insist on leading us into these situations. I see no reason why we need to talk with this Parker fella. I explained it fifty times. We're following the path of those fat twins in Abilene. I'd say I appreciate your persistence, but I'm shot. Let me look at it. Brant eased back against the side of his makeshift fortress, watching passively as Matt dug through his bag. He felt deeply annoyed with the entire situation. You said the Baylor brothers didn't speak much with Quanah Parker. Why are you so sure we can learn anything from talking with this man? There you go, assuming it's an exact science. This country is a straight shot from Ulysses, so I figured we would stop here first. Plus, I, I had a hunch. Well, your hunch got me shot in the leg. Now I say we move on. I've had enough. Matt started to respond, but he knew Brent was right. They couldn't hang around much longer waiting for Quana to appear. Matt examined Brant's wound. The bullet, probably a poorly executed reload, had been fired from a sawed-off rifle. The end of the slug protruded from the hole. Removing it would hurt, but the damage was superficial. It's not that bad, but I need to get the wound cleaned up, Matt said. Just wrap it up for now. It needs to be clean so it doesn't fester. We only have two bags of water. There's a whole creek full right down there. When it gets dark, we can refill the bags. Now sit still. What about a little sip of whiskey for the pain? Matt eyed his partner critically, then pulled a bottle from his pack. Get you a couple of pulls, but that's it. You may have to do more shooting. Brant examined the bottle. Wish I had a glass so I could uh, take my time with my sip. This here's good whiskey. I don't have a glass. Matt regarded Brant critically. Two small sips. If it'll make you happy, I'll just sit here and suffer while you poke around on my leg. You've seen a man with a bullet hole that got festered up, right? You want to be limping around on one leg for the rest of your days? It might be better than listening to you. You're as bad as my mama. A normal man knows when to quit. Well, maybe I ain't normal. Oh, dang, Matt, what the hell are you doing? Just leave it be. I'm pulling the bullet out. It's, it's not even hardly in there. It's in there good enough so it hurts like hell. Just leave it. Hang on. Matt rummaged in one of his bags and produced a pair of forceps. What in the hell? Matt looked nervously at the surgical clamps. These are forceps. 
I decided we needed ourselves a basic medical kit and read up on it. Dr. Elias Cooper suggests a scalpel, forceps, and bone saw as basic tools, as well as gauze, bandages, iodine, and morphine. There are a few other items. Looks like a fancy pair of tweezers. Exactly. Now hold still. I'm going to get the lead out of your leg. Hang on a second. Brant took another large gulp from the bottle. Take it easy on the whiskey. I'm celebrating. Every day I get a bullet pulled out of my leg by a jackass. Hold still. Ow. Dang it. No. Ow. God damn it. Uh, that ain't. No. Almost have it. How the hell am I supposed to hold still when. Ow. Dang. Got it. Matt displayed the slug for Brant's approval. Let me see that whiskey. I think I'm going to spew. A half second later, Brant emptied the contents of his stomach onto the sandy soil at his side. You okay? PG. Hold still whilst I do one more thing. Matt splashed the open wound with the whiskey. God dang! As a disinfectant. Matt gathered the water bag and poured a bit of water onto the wound and then pulled out a bar of soap. What are you going to do with that soap? Brad asked. He had never liked bathing. This is something doctors in the war learned. The wound must be well cleaned to kill microorganisms. Micro... what the hell? Tiny creatures first discovered by a man named Hook in the 17th century. Physicians believe they are the primary cause of infection. I have... Uh, no, sir. What the hell are they? Microorganisms. They are invisible to the eye and ubiquitous everywhere. As I said, doctors discovered in the war that cleaning wounds reduced infection. Just relax. How the hell up can I relax with these microorganisms in my... Give me that damn bottle. Pratt, relax. I'm sorry I mentioned it. I thought you would find it interesting. I, I just need to clean the wound. Brant tried his best to relax, watching nervously as Matt applied soap, then dried and wrapped the bullet wound. To take his mind off the ordeal, he redirected his attention to their surroundings, scanning for the return of the native boys. They were alone. Finishing with the bandaging, Matt pulled a small black bottle from his pack. I suppose a little something for the pain wouldn't hurt. I don't want any laudanum, Matt. I'm sorry if it hurt. I'm good. Matt nodded and settled by Brant's side. You're right, he said. I don't need to talk with Quana. We'll head out in the morning. 